Welcome to RV to Freedom Live with Carenza and Brandon. We are here tonight with Heather Ryan, the tax queen. She is also the Roman Ryans. And so and my so name is my Heather name is Ryan. Ryan. I am I an enrolled agent, agent, which means that I am licensed by the IRS to practice taxes. Um, I can practice taxes in any state. So that's kind of the difference of a CPA is licensed by a state, whereas I'm licensed by the IRS. That's great. That's a little bit about me. Uh, I also live in an RV, if you can see me and my video. I'm in my RV, uh, I live in a fifth wheel. And yeah, that's a little bit about me. <laughs> I've been on the road since September of 2016. So we got a little intro from you and you know, that's, that's great. So it's kind of interesting because your perspective is, I mean, you, you do taxes for a living, you know this stuff, but you're also a full-timer. So you know what it means to be a full-timer and it's, it's not just like you, you're going to someone and they're going, you do what? You live in it full time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. You understand our concerns. I do. <laughs> I great. <laughs> right. You totally love it. So we're just going to jump right in here and get to some of that stuff. Um, one of the questions we had from a student one time was about tax advantages for full timers. And, you know, if there are any and what you can take and if it just I guess just any kind of tax advantages. I can't say it's better or worse. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, it's not really better or worse. I wouldn't say there's technically actual advantages of it, of living in an RV. There are credits that you, you can take, though. Um, so you can take the, if you have a loan on your fifth wheel or class A, whatever, you are allowed to take that interest. It's, it qualifies as home interest. So if you can itemize deductions, you know, that's allowed. And then also a lot of RVers like to put solar on their the rigs and you can definitely get a credit for solar and it's 30%, which is huge uh, when you think about it. So that's a huge savings. Yeah, we really did that. Good. We took that credit and that was a big one for us because we, we kind of did a big system. So yeah, yeah that's awesome, actually right? had a question in here about yeah, that. Yeah. They wanted to upgrade their solar, adding more panels and wondered if they could take that solar energy credit. And yes. so if you upgrade your system, as long as you add panels, you can take the credit. So if you add a battery, you have to add panel as well. You can't just add a battery. <laughs> oh, good, good call. Good yeah. to know. Yeah, that makes sense? <laughs> yeah. So, so like the maybe actual someone, solar part. Someone put like two panels and a battery and they're like, oh, that's not enough to power my rig. And the next year they say, OK, I'm going to add another battery and another two panels. You can take it again. So. Yeah. Um, that credit's going away as well, right? The credit is not going away, not that I know of. Oh, okay. I thought it was diminishing over the, the next few It diminishes years. Uh, starting in 2021, I think. It's oh, okay. 2020 that's or 2021. Than I thought it was. Yeah, yeah that's so good. for 18 yeah. and 19, 19 it's definitely, definitely allowed. allowed. Nice. So the solar tax credit is a big one. And then, yes, the um, interest on your loan. Interest. Interest on your loan because it is it is your full time home. Or sometimes can you do it as a second home also? You can do it as a second home. And that's typically where I see somebody who, who can use that because they can claim, you know, itemized deductions because they already have home interest. So you're just adding that second home. Yeah. Yeah. So nice. Great. Now the um someone just added, asked a question. The solar tax credit, that's an actual credit like cash and not just a deduction. Um, it is, it's a credit. It's, it's not a deduction. Uh, it's just not a non-refundable credit. So there's a difference of a non-refundable credit versus a refundable credit. Um, as a solar, the solar credit, you basically get the 30% if your tax obligation. So let's just, let's give numbers to give an example, because that might be a little more helpful. Um, let's say your tax obligation is is $5,000 and you get a solar credit of $3,000. So that's going to come off that 5,000 and now your tax owed is 2,000. But if okay. your tax obligation started at 2,000 and you have a $3,000 solar credit, you get to carry over that $1,000 credit to the next year. Oh, okay. Nice. So, so it's, it's not refundable, credit, but not, you can carry yeah. it over. Yeah. Nice. So you can okay. still take advantage of all of it. Just maybe not all in one year. Correct. Nice. So it just depends on your income and yeah. 
Yeah. Personal situations, which we should say up front, every situation is <laughs> going to be different, right? Yeah. And yep. so there's always going to be little bits and this is general things that apply to our viewers, but every situation is going to be different in what you take and what you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, we also have a lot of questions everybody wants to know because you domicile in one state. So you're choosing to say Florida, for instance is where you live and where you domicile. And, but then you're traveling all across the country and you're living in different places and you're earning income in these different states. So how does this affect both employees and self-employed RVers and how are you paying each state? You know, do you have to file with each state? <laughs> oh, and I yeah. know that's hard. <laughs> Get, this gets really sticky really fast. Um, so usually what I say, if you're a W-2 employee and you just happen to work remotely, that's awesome. Uh, just use whatever your whatever home address home is, address, whether that's whether in Texas that's or Florida or, Florida or New York. It doesn't matter. Uh, whatever your domicile address is, that's where you pay taxes. Um, as, as a self-employed, it gets a little stickier and it depends on what you're doing for a living is kind of how I look at it is if you're an artist and you're traveling to different States to do art festivals, now you're earning income in that state and it, you owe a tax return to that state on that, just that income, just, that income. just a little bit of income. Little bit of income. income. Um, and then also and if you're a work camper, camper, so maybe you so spend six spend months six in the summer in Montana doing work camping, uh, you owe the state of Montana state taxes, state taxes on, that on that income. income. So that's kind of the best couple of examples. Um, but again, you know, it's individual basis. So. Is there anywhere that people can figure out like what they owe each state or I know it's a pain to like, you know, like some states it's if you're there for so long, you owe the money. And if you're not there, or there's for a, certain a amount threshold, of time, a, yeah. an amount that if it's, at a certain threshold above that, then you owe money. And if not, it's, it's every, every state, state has, has different, different rules <laughs> regarding yeah. all that. So it's really hard to say, you know, for all 50 states. Um, and I also know there are some states that recognize um, income tax paid to other states. So like, you know, Washington, D.C. and Maryland, you know, they have reciprocal agreements. You don't if you work in Washington, D.C. and live in Maryland, you don't owe Washington, D.C you know, income tax kind of deal, like in Virginia, you know, as when they're smaller, they, um, they kind of, yeah, they, they call it reciprocal agreements. Um, but yeah, as far as like a time period, it depends. Like California, the second you stepped into the state and you do, you do business there, you owe taxes. Um, New York is the same way. So it's just individual state. Usually I say, if you do, if you, if you're being like a blogger and you're just, you know, using the internet and anybody who pays you, it's getting it paid like to whatever your domicile address is, I say, just keep it quiet. You're not, you weren't in California. Right. You were there on vacation. <laughs> right. You were working there. I mean, that, I know maybe that's lying, but um, that's kind of how I feel. And it's really only if you're physically, you know, meeting a client and working for a client. You know, like I said, if you're a photographer or something and you go to California and you work on a photo shoot there, yes, you're going to owe taxes. If you just happen to be driving through and you're a blogger, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't report anything to the state of California. That's okay. my personal philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Cause it can get very tricky trying to Correct. manage all that, it can, like figure out where you were and how much you made during each little trip. <laughs> and, and that's, I think it's really time consuming and just not worth the energy and effort. Um, nobody is ever going to know you were in that state. State. like there's nothing to tie you like unless like I said you were actually physically you know you go and participate in a festival or you're going into a client's office um or you know doing a photo shoot somewhere it's like that's a little more yeah I was there you know that's very mm -hmm. much proof um but that's why I say that's nobody I knows what state you're in and where you are at what date <laughs> Right. Yeah. Now, work camping, you just mentioned that, but there, I mean, that's kind of tying you to the state if you're there for months and. Correct. Work know. camping, I would not, I would definitely file the state. Um, it's just when you're, you're self employed, it's just really hard to say, you know, I'm working from yeah. my home. My home just happens to move. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, just related to work camping, since we're talking about that, if you are only working for a free spot, you're not working for money. 
is there a tax obligation on that or is that just kind of a a thing that happens you don't worry about it um again this is kind of like a sticky situation and you can technically consider that bartering mm -hmm. and so you may have to report you know the fair fair cost of that site um as income okay but that's really like a risk or are you willing to take that risk or you know is is the the camp host or whoever owns that campground, you know, are they reporting any kind of income or any, anything to the IRS? Like, you just, you want to be careful. That's all. But uh, yeah. good records and, you know, don't raise red flags. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that can be considered bartering. So. Okay. And there was a question here uh, related to working mm -hmm. from the road. Yeah. yeah I, I don't know. I don't that. know if you can see them on your phone or not, but it's, um, She's asking, can, I, can they deduct mileage um, from their RV as a self-employed person? She's a magazine publisher and occasionally visits locations that are related to the industry. So you can take mileage. Um, so like if you're parked somewhere and you're going into the office to meet that magazine publisher, you can you can take that as mileage. You know, traveling from point A to point B with your home, uh, whether it's a class A or a, a trailer, a travel trailer or whatever, you, you can't count that. But the actual, like using a toad or a truck, um, or maybe if you have a class B, obviously you have to drive in because that's your only vehicle, um, that you can take mileage. But between campgrounds, you can't. Right. Because um, it's your home. It's your, You're taking your home. Correct. Right. It's your choice, yeah, to, to live in this and to, to drive those miles, so. Okay. Nice. So the difference, let me just also clarify, if that person, that magazine publisher wanted you to come into the office and you, let's say, were in Florida and that magazine publisher is in Colorado and you're like, okay, I need to go and visit them next month and you want to fly there, then you can take those. You leave your home parked in Florida and you fly to Colorado for the week and you incur expenses. And the, the way that IRS looks at it is you're duplicating expenses. That's the explanation that they give. So you you have, you know, two two homes basically now. Now you have a hotel cost and you have your house that you've left behind that you're paying maybe to park in a campground. Uh, you, you have maybe a rental car. You flew somewhere. You have food that, you know, you have to eat out. All those are expenses mm -hmm. you can take. So Okay. Nice. All right, great. So well, where, where are we in the questions here? <laughs> let's see. Okay. So if someone is domiciled, let's say in Texas, um, and they, they're a full-time remote employee for a company in California and they're traveling, um, who's, do they do they owe tax? Well, well I guess I we know. did kind of cover some of yeah, that. Yeah, we did but... kind of cover that because they're, they're <laughs> they going to be. They would pay Texas away. income tax, but there's no Texas state income tax, so they're they're right. Out of hook. <laughs> Why yeah. people domicile there, exactly. right? Yeah. Yeah. So the now, only difference is if they were to travel to California again and work in that office, even just one week, they would owe. Okay. Okay. So that's right. just on them to make sure they pay the right people the right amount of money, um, for however long. Well, they <laughs> yeah, and actually, a lot of California businesses know this this rules. So if they have remote employees and they bring them into their office, they know that they have to take out the state income tax. Okay, uh, it just de depends on the business, you know, how big it is and who who their accountants are, but and their payroll departments. Um, but I do, I have a friend that you know, I, I we left from the Denver area, and she lives in Colorado and works remotely for a bank that's based out of California and travels there often to work and she has to pay California state income taxes Nice. Mm. Uh, just on that income earned. It can be, you know, a week or two weeks. Yeah. Of income. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> nice. Uh, on the same vein of that, if you domicile in one state, but you actually you own a business, but the business is formed in another state, is there anything around that? Like how that works? Uh, well, typically most businesses are passed through income, so they're passing any profits and losses to the owners. So you're paying that income tax wherever you're domiciled. Okay. So no matter it, it doesn't it doesn't matter where the business is located. Okay, Does that makes sense. That's clear. So even if you, you form it in some other place, you'll you'll still pay taxes in Texas, and then Texas doesn't have taxes, so you're correct. Happy. So unless it's a C corp, in which case you know C corps pay 
corporate taxes, but anything else, an S corp, an LLC, a sole proprietor, they all pass their income down to to the okay. to the owner or the members. So nice, yeah. And <laughs> there's a lot of stuff about domiciling in one state and having something else. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> once you become an RVer, it's this weird thing where you live in one place but you travel all over the place. So right, people don't know how that works exactly. So. so uh, when you saying like so i since we left from denver let's say we kept our house there and are renting it out and now we're we have a rental property there is that what yes people are yeah asking? that's what's exactly. going to be the question yeah so a lot of people want to move they want to rent out their house but they right. want to domicile like in florida or texas or something okay yeah. um yeah like um, i said yeah, like you're I said, still gonna still... owe to whatever that state is wherever that house is because you're making an income there and that's that right. rental income so you would owe to that state for that rental income. Nice. Okay. One of, one of the things actually, to consider when renting out a house. <laughs> right. Right. Not necessarily a bad thing, but just something to remember to, yeah. Right. Nice. Keep, keep uh, going. Well, I was going to uh, actually <laughs> go with the question that you just covered up. So okay. I think he <laughs> understands. Um, okay. You get it up there? Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, I think Tina understands um, the mileage, but we just want to confirm here. So she's saying, okay, so I can't deduct the mileage while she's towing the trailer only from once we park it and only from once they park it to the client's location. So even she needs to tow her home because she's a magazine publisher from home, from her home in Oregon to Idaho in order to meet with a client. She can't deduct that because that's her home and she's trailering it. Once she's in Idaho, she when she takes that tow vehicle and goes to meet the client, that expense correct, is correct. deductible. Correct. Or that so the, the exception to the rule is if, let's say, you spend your winter in Florida because you have a house there, and you, even if you park your RV, you have a plot of land, you have a house, you know, like a, a small house that has a bedroom, a kitchen. Um, a bathroom, and then in the summertime, I'm like, I don't want to be in Florida because it's too hot. So I go. <laughs> And I travel for six months. So, yeah, you're not a full-timer, right? But you're traveling for six months out of the year. You're still domiciled in Florida. Um, but maybe I also i am traveling because I have to meet with clients that are, live up north. Or I'm, I'm an author and I'm doing a book tour. And I decide mm -hmm. to take my RV and do my book tour. Those miles would count. So that's the difference. Of, are you using it 100% for business? Are you, you know, going to these places? You know, maybe like even a musician, you know, they're traveling because they have to go and do concerts. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's kind of the, the drawing line is if you still have that sticks and bricks location mm -hmm. that you can call home and you're traveling literally for work versus I just live in my, my RV and I happen to travel around the country and occasionally I might go into an office and meet with somebody. Okay. But, does that help clarify? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it really comes down to, are you really moving for business or are you just living in the RV because you like to live in the RV and now you have to move it back to business because you were the silly one that drove away in the first place, <laughs> kind sure. of, you know. <laughs> um, yep. So on that note, um, people yes. ask all the time about, like right now we have a home office in our RV, like our whole credenza mm -hmm. is our home office, but, you know, can we deduct some part of our RV you know, like you would in a house. As a home office. As a home, a home office. office deduction. Yeah. So I typically say no. I mean, I don't I don't know exactly how your RV is set up. Um, the exceptions is like if you have we a know. bunk house. <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. Um, if you have a bunk house and that bunk house is set up as an office, like the IRS defines home office as 100% use mm -hmm. for, for business. Now, I mean, even a person in a Sticks and Bricks house probably doesn't use their home office 100%. But that's what their definition is. Um, and then like I live in, in a toy hauler. So we have our back 10 foot garage is our office or my husband's oh. office, I should say. Um, so technically, yeah, we could we could claim that. I mean, we don't have anything else back there. Yeah, we walk through it or whatever. But um, so th those are usually the exceptions. Otherwise, I say no, because our V's are too small to claim 100 yeah. percent of space for yeah. business use. Yeah. yeah. For us personally, ours, it's our credenza. It's in in the living room. Yeah. Right behind and... us is the couch. Right. So it's. 
And you know, you know our computers are sitting here, but I then we also doesn't count. <laughs> so we're like, not even. That no, is like, no. <laughs> not even going to pass. But yeah, yeah. That's, that's typically what I see. But like I said, you know, a, a bunkhouse, somebody who is really right. intent on it, a bunkhouse or a toy hauler, and literally have that as your office space i think that could be legitimate yeah. you could you argue that close it off and it's mm-hmm. like really used just yeah. for that <laughs> yeah our, our kind of uh, way of thinking about it is that sometimes rving does kind of operate in a gray area so we prefer not to raise any flags and Correct. we don't really pay that much in taxes anyway because of the rv life mm-hmm. so it's not like we're going to save a ton by <laughs> And that's, that's usually what I say, like, here, what are you going to really save if you take the home office deduction? And then, but you're raising this red flag. And do you really want that red flag dangling exactly. out there for them to see? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, a, isn't it a home office can, is kind of sometimes a red flag anyway in a home? It can or be. It, yeah, it can, it can be. be. Yeah. Like, yeah, but in this tiny little space, it's like, ah, yeah. yeah. I don't it would need be it. hard to argue. I think it would be hard to argue. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I really don't want to try. <laughs> no, yeah. we never put anything else on our credenza. Nothing. But Tina said, like he has, that we don't pay a lot in taxes. <laughs> we pay a fair share in taxes, but we don't have a house where we're paying property taxes. And right. we live in a state that doesn't have state income tax. We're not paying state income taxes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, our lifestyle is less expensive as well. So, you know, that's why I it's like. Count your blessings, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, we pay a lot for what we're doing, but not a lot in the grand scheme of everybody. Yeah. So it's Uh been nice. And we take advantage of, you know, BLM land and public lands that are taxpayer funded. So, you know, we don't mind when Mm -hmm. we have to pay because we get to use those places. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Is there any other tax things that you wanted to discuss that we didn't get to um, that might relate more to full timers or RVers? Where all the RVers bug you about all the time. (laughs) Uh, I mean, I get a lot of just mostly like small, small business questions, you know, what can I take just in general, um, you know, like is software, can I take, I bought a new computer, can I use that, uh, you know, all those kinds of deductions, and that's not necessarily RV related, that's just owning yeah, a business. Just um, general. A lot of people, when they step into an RV, they have never owned a business before, and now they're thrown into that, you know, entrepreneurship and biz- small business yeah. ownership, so they're, they've got a lot of questions around that. Um Otherwise, I mean, I think we've covered a lot of the typical, like, yeah, I live here and I work there kind of things. Um, It's kind of a hard thing to get your wrap your head around if you haven't done it. You know, you haven't been through a cycle of of tax season yet. (laughs) And And also, you know, we live we don't live in one state. Most people live their whole life or at least when they're living in one spot, they're living in one state. Yeah. You know, so. Once you start living in different states all the time and you have this domicile over here, or maybe you have your old house that you're renting in somewhere else, it, it feels weird, but it's not unsurmountable. It's pretty straightforward. No. It gets, yeah. it does get a little more complicated. And I always say, you know, if you're really questioning things, you know, get help. Don't, don't mess okay. around. <laughs> um, <laughs> you want to get it, you want to get it right on the first time, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's not insurmountable. It's definitely doable. Okay. Now, for people that have, um, this is a question I thought about from someone else I was talking to. He's a New York State resident. He owns a place in New York City, and he's renting it out. Um, but he's keeping his domicile in New York just because he has that rental property there. Is there, I mean, is there any reason he shouldn't just go ahead and switch to Florida or somewhere else to save on taxes if he's full time on the road? I would. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I mean. New York can sometimes be a stickler because they have a lot of snowbirds. Um, yeah. And so they really want to make sure that you've left the state. And as long as he can prove that uh, with a domicile address, you know, legal address, I don't see a problem with that. I mean, he's still going to owe for, for that rental to New York, New York City and New York State. You know, they, New York City is a real fun one. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We used to live in New Jersey and work in New York. And so, yeah. Yeah, so they, you know, they get... <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, they're really strict with taxes and they will come after you if they question anything. So that's why I just say I, I don't see a problem with him moving or this person if this is fictional or for real. I don't know. Um, yeah. But like, just make sure you have all your ducks in a row. 
Nice. All right. Well, and you touched on, uh, you know, getting it right the first time and just asking <laughs> for help. So what would you look for in a tax advisor when you're, especially when you're full time? Is it better to go to someone like you who really knows what it's like or what I mean, kind of questions would of you ask? Of course she's going to say it's better to go to well, her. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to say put yourself out a tax, here. A tax person. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. You can come to me. That's, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but I think you should really feel comfortable with the tax person. You should trust that person. Um, they should, you know, give you 15, 20 minutes of their time to be able to be, get on a phone call, um, you know, explain your situation and just have them answer some basic questions. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm, that, that's what I do for my clients. I'm, I'd love to, you know, hear your situation and then I can also give you a price for your situation. Uh, but yeah, I mean, make sure that person is comfortable finding multiple states because you may, you may be in that category um, so that they know, you know, some people wouldn't feel comfortable finding New York state if they lived in Ohio and that's all they worked with was their clients in Ohio. So just make sure that that's comfortable for them. Um, and there's plenty of places you can go, um, to check references and stuff, you know, ask, ask them, Hey, can I speak to, you know, do you have a testimonial? Can I speak to one of your current clients? I'd love to, you know, make sure that I can trust you. Uh, and the best way also friends or family, if they have a trusted accountant or a tax professional, you know, I don't see anything wrong with that either. So, but right. Yeah, I've always avoided the tax the tax people that are always like, well, if you do this, then you won't have to pay as much taxes, and just just tell them you did all this for work, and just tell them you you know the people that seem like they're trying to like pump up your expenses to to get your taxes yeah. down. It's like it seems scary, and I just don't want people yeah. to know. <laughs> And that's just, I mean, that's your gut feeling, right? Some The yeah. person sitting next to you might be like, whatever, I don't care if I cheat on my taxes. And that's their responsibility. And in the end, you're always responsible for your own tax return, even if someone prepares it for you. You're responsible for the correct information. So if if you give your tax person the wrong information and that's how they fill it out, that's on you. That's not on your tax preparer. And yeah. if the tax preparer falsifies the information, that's a different situation. But... Um, you are always responsible for your numbers and stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so you yeah, I make... mean, you, you should trust that person. Like I said, you know, they're making the right choices. They're, they're not being sketchy or trying to, to raise flags or, you know, doing anything that kind of seems out of line. Right. And if they so... are question them. <laughs> so we did have another question. If you guys have any more questions, pop them in because we're kind of wrapping up here. So we want to make sure to answer anything we can. Mm -hmm. um, and Brandon, go ahead. So yeah, you might want to read this one if you can. Um, to give an overview here. Yeah, uh, so John, he lives in an RV full time, but he's stationary. Um, so he just, he's not really traveling except for his daily commute. But in the next couple of years, he may retire or go out on the road. Um, so is there anything he needs to prepare for for living on the road tax wise? Um, I'm trying to, I'm reading it. I'm just like trying to gauge here. I don't, I mean like the, like kind of what we talked about, it depends. I mean, is if you say I'm a W2 employee, then no, because again, you're just paying whatever based on your domicile address. Um, if you're a 1099 employee, then you, that means you have, have a small business. Um, and so again, you may start owing income tax to different states. So that's the really big thing to look out for. Okay. So nothing really to prepare for while he's getting ready for the road. Mostly just once you're on the road, start paying attention. Yeah. I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't, taxes <laughs> really aren't that scary. I, I promise. <laughs> yeah. It scares everybody, yeah. but yeah. I know. Except people. for the people who do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we had a question here, and this might this might ruffle feathers, but we'll see. What what are your thoughts on TurboTax? I think TurboTax is great for a really simple return. So someone who earns just a simple W two and doesn't have all these itemized deductions and doesn't have all these questions. Um, but when you start to get into small business ownership um, and you get more complicated situations, you have a rental income. It I just think you're better off having that trusted tax professional. Um, someone like myself, I answer questions throughout the year. So if something changes, um, all of a sudden you, you know, have this huge jump in income, I can help you assess, you know, what your tax liability is going to be throughout the year, not just one time a year. 
Um, yeah. So I, yeah, I think I think tempered dice is really useful for like a really simple case, but once you get complicated, I'm not a big fan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that I I did our taxes for for a long time, but when we started we started our own own businesses and stuff, I was like, I'm out. Mm-mm. Yeah, I, I'm not messing different with states. it. Yeah, Income we started was moving changing. states. Yeah, it was like Income would fluctuate year to year, and then we had to deal with <laughs> estimated taxes. And now you have to deal with like estimated income and your health care and stuff too it's like everything right. kind of so that's is... what i usually say like working with a tax professional they're there to help you and guide you answer questions they know the laws <laughs> and the changes that are happening you know they're keeping up with all that for you so they can help guide you in the right direction and make sure you know you you have your lowest tax obligation that that's possible for your situation so mm -hmm. it's kind of like you know do you trust, you know, your dentist? Like you go to the dentist and they tell you, you know, your teeth are clean and all is good, right? And you have to go for checkups twice a year. I mean, it's, it's kind of yeah. the same idea. Like you should be checking up, especially as a small business owner, you know, checking in with your tax professional. Um, you know, how, how, am I, how am I doing, you know, this year after making it quarterly estimated payments, all that stuff? Am I keeping on top of it? So Nice. So there's a um, this question, and this may not be as much tax related as it as it is more of a domicile question, but we'll throw it out. Um, sure. They plan. They live in Texas and plan to go full time. Do they need to physically be in Texas six months of the year to be to claim residency? <laughs> and um, for us, we never were, um, and even we're Florida yeah. residents. And we've we're never in Florida that long. Correct. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Um, you do not need to be there. The only way you would need to be there is if you kept your home. So like you, you keep a home there and you want to, that's, that's your domicile address is your home address. And let's say you don't rent out your house. You just keep it there and you live in it six months. Then, then you'd have to be there for that residency. If that makes sense. But if you use yeah. like a mail service or something, that's your legal address. That's, you don't need to be in the state. As a matter of fact, I'm a Florida resident and for the, so we registered in Florida a year ago in January, and for the first time, our RV and trailer actually saw Florida this year in November. So nice. <laughs> yeah, we registered in Florida um, about well, October last year, and um, oh, I think two years ago. Two years ago, and we'll get back to Florida this winter. So yeah, yeah. I think it, it's more it works the other way around in some states. If you stay in the state too long. Um, depending on the state, they could claim you as a resident and then or correct resident for taxes at least. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's usually, like I said, they only catch you in a situation like that is if you have a lease. Um, and if you're in a campground for six months, then you technically do have a lease. So mm -hmm. um, they can prove that you were there, but yeah. Yeah. If you boondock, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to find you. Desert of Arizona. It's pretty hard to track you down. <laughs> yeah. Unless you're posting everything on Facebook where you are all the time. Correct. Yeah. Okay, so Mike has um, has a question here. When they go full time, they'll be half time in for an Arizona nonprofit and spending four months a year in Arizona. And so they'll only make revenue, I guess, for those four months. While no, they're... well, they'll only make revenue in Arizona for those four months. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Um, but they'll be domiciled in Texas. Yeah. So okay, he's so wondering when you go only... full time, you'll be working full time actually... for an Arizona nonprofit. I think so. Yeah. yeah so then you'd be a W2 employee of that. Yes. Yeah. So I guess he's, he's actually this. posted two comments here, but basically what it comes down to is for four months, he'll be living and working in Arizona, but he'll be okay. a Texas resident, uh, Texas domicile. Yeah. So then the four months he would owe for that four months he would owe for Arizona. Yes. Right. Okay. So yeah, yeah Mike, you would be, you would need to pay taxes to Arizona for, for those four months of income. But I, you know, like, I mean, I haven't actually ever filed in Arizona. I have never any, had anyone had any income there. So I would personally, as a tax professional, look up their rules of, of how long you have to be there to be considered that. Okay. Yeah. And then they have a threshold. I think it's like nine months to be considered a resident. But basically, yeah. yeah, you'll have. I mean, I can't, I can't know every state off the top of my head. <laughs> no, why would you? Come on. We just happened to like hear There's that only recently. There's change yeah. every year. Right? I, I, exactly. I know like the really big ones. Um, yeah. like I said California and New York are really the two sticklers, like really mm -hmm. bad about coming after people. So. Yeah. So yeah. So basically, Mike, um, 
when you're there and you're making money there, you'll need to pay money to that state. And when you're not there and you're still being paid by that company, then you don't have to pay money to that state because you're not there. Um, but that'll be something to go over with your tax professional and make sure that you guys get it all worked out right. And um, I don't know if we mentioned this or if we got kind of lost in the, the shuffle at the beginning, but your website, uh, Heather, is yes. taxqueen. Tax tax-queen.com. Yeah, yeah nice. there you go. And so everybody can find you there. And uh, yeah, and we're running in tax season right now. <laughs> I yeah. don't know how busy you uh, are. And not just a little bonus, um, I have an ebook that I'm giving away on my website. Um, so if you go there and it's helpful for small business owners, so it gives you uh, forming a business and all the deductions you can take, expenses, all that stuff, explains all that. So if anyone's interested, you're welcome to to that. <laughs> nice. That's great. Yeah, and you very work, helpful. You work a lot with um, RV entrepreneurs because you're, you're down at the RV Entrepreneur mm -hmm. Summit right now, right? I'm not there yet. Oh, you're flying. on your way. Yeah, because that's yeah, like we're she's flying. Right now, and that's in Florida. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so you're flying to the phone there. Yeah, yes. but yeah, so for so people, my that are... husband is business partners with Heath, so who is yeah. the RV entrepreneur? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, hopefully the uh, the campground booking's going well. We we saw the one um, the Wait, one so the blog next, post right after night, it launched, but the yeah. next day was better. Is nice. What Heather said. Nice. <laughs> and yes, it is getting better. It, it's That's all, awesome because we all need that thing to work. It's, it's <laughs> the blogs have been mostly worked out. So. Nice. <laughs> nice. Great. So tax tax queen dot com, and let's get the Roman Ryan's up there too because people might just want to follow along on their sure. yeah, adventure. That, that's really just my personal page. What we do, where we go. Um, sometimes I'll give tips if if I can think of them that they'll be helpful. So. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Sorry, trying to make it look better. Roman Ryan. <laughs> And some people can follow along on your journey there too. And you guys have some social media, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. So Roman Ryan says social media on Instagram, Facebook, and Tax Queen is on Facebook. On Facebook. Nice. Great. Well, thank you so much for your yeah. your help here. I know that it's a subject everybody is always worried about. And yeah, it's not that hard, but it sounds so crazy when you're talking about it. Like, wait a minute. I'm going to live in one place and just move around. Yeah. I think so. what's the bottom line of it all is all of the RV stuff seems hard, but once you start doing it, it's not that hard and it's actually kind of fun and it's different. And you know, once you get past the different, it's uh, it's pretty exciting. And you're not seeing it right now, but there are a lot of thanks for the information and the ebook and all the people that you answer questions for have all thank you. So we appreciate well, thanks you for having on. me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and doing this it's great it's great to have the expert and to know that you really know the lifestyle too so you're not just going hmm well i guess it'd be like this because you live it you know what right. they're con what we're all concerned about so yep. and what we and mean we have, when we and not only that but we talking. have businesses on the road so <laughs> right exactly so you're living it totally <laughs> so great so thank you so much um yeah. thank you everyone in the audience and we appreciate you guys immensely and yep. we'll see you next week same rv time same <laughs> rv channel yeah, yeah same know. rv time same we don't know we're channel. gonna see it but yeah we'll see we haven't done that yeah all right bye guys bye everybody bye we hope you enjoyed this replay of our facebook live show Join our Facebook community to participate in the live shows and learn how to live in an RV. Go to rvtofreedomgroup.com to join the RV to Freedom Facebook group. And to be notified about our next live videos and more, sign up with the link provided below in the video description. We want to help you find your RV to Freedom.